Chapter 1. It's Your Time To everything there is a season, and a time to every purpose under the heaven, a time to be born, and a time to die, a time to plant, and a time to pluck up that which is planted, a time to kill, and a time to heal, a time to break down, and a time to build up, a time to weep, and a time to laugh, a time to mourn, and a time to dance. Ecclesiastes 3, 1 through 4, KJV. Your time is limited, so don't waste it living someone else's life. Don't be trapped by dogma, which is living with the results of other people's thinking. Don't let the noise of others' opinions drown out your own inner voice. And most important, have the courage to follow your heart and intuition. They somehow already know what you truly want to become. Everything else is secondary. Steve Jobs, CEO, Apple Computers Before we move forward, it is important that you understand that the promise of success is right now and for you. I understand that I have given you a glimpse of your journey from its end rather from its beginning. I may have spoiled the surprise, but knowing the end of the journey will give you courage during your journey. We all have a tendency to be waiting for God's promises rather than working toward those promises. Why should we waste precious time waltzing around our living room hoping for some miracle to happen? The rewards at the end are determined by our commitment to the process of reaching those rewards. That commitment will require work, patience, courage, pain, creativity, effort, and laughter. Laughter is a key to enduring the process and reaching your goal. It is one of the most dynamic of the positive attributes and it flows from your inner soul. I'm not saying that there will not be tears and disappointment. What I am saying is that we must embrace the highs and the lows as we recognize the joy of life under any conditions. Martin Berber elaborates in his Tales of the Hasidim that the core of a Hasidic teachings is the concept of a life of favor, of exalted joy. The Jews, a people who have probably suffered more than any other people in the history of the world, have learned to alleviate their sorrow with laughter. Better to laugh than to cry, says an old Yiddish proverb. While Jews account for less than 2.5% of the USA's population, Approximately 70% of the USA's working comedians are Jewish. Mel Brooks, the Mark Brothers, Woody Allen, Milton Berle, Jerry Lewis, Jerry Seinfeld, Billy Crystal, Gilda Radner, John Stewart, Weird Al, Jack Benny, George Burns, and many others. Action and Reaction some of God's promises are unconditional. An unconditional promise means that God determines that he is going to act in a certain way, and he does it. But most of his promises are conditional. God says, if you do this, then I will do that. It's all about action and reaction. Unfortunately, many have become addicted to outside stimuli to encourage them motivate them, and baby them. They become automatons, marching to the beat of religious incentives, and can find no interior stimuli to motivate them through the pain of life's obstacles. You need to know how to respond to the sound of God. That's a healthy thing. And, conversely, God has to respond to your cry for help. This is the law of spiritual gravity. What goes up will certainly come down. You are not alone in your battles. There is a supernatural force that is available to you as you seek to reach your destiny. 
But one of the keys to success is in how you respond to what is given you. It is not enough to have a promise. You have to act on that promise. There is God's part, and then there's your part. For every divine action, there must be a human reaction. One evening, whilst King Solomon was asleep, he heard these words, If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. 2 Chronicles 7, 14, KJV Our actions create a response in the earthly and the heavenly realm. When we are faced with insurmountable problems, we can respond in one of two ways. We can look at the problem and shrink back in panic and perplexity, or we can forge ahead with courage and confidence. There is an enemy who seeks to block your pathway and keep you from reaching your personal God-given assignment. This enemy seeks to convince you that your time will never come. He creates illusions of delays and denials, trying to convince you that God doesn't care. You must ignore his little tricks and understand that God does care and that he is working with you to make your dreams come true. This enemy realizes that if he can successfully convince you that the day of promise will never come, then he knows that this unbelief will paralyze you with fear and cause you to slip into a spiritual dormancy. The only thing that will guarantee your failure is quitting. Those who win in this life are not those who never fail. Winners are those who never quit. Habakkuk, one of the great prophets of Israel, coined these words, For the vision is yet for the appointed time. It hastens towards the goal, and it will not fail. Though it tarries, wait for it, for it will certainly come. It will not delay. Habakkuk 2.3 NASB In a similar vein of thought, Solomon, the builder of the Jewish temple, added these words, Hope deferred maketh the heart sick, but when the desire cometh, it is a tree of life. Proverbs 13, 12, KJV Once you give up to despair and give up to disappointment, you're done. It's over. No matter how difficult your circumstance may appear, you must realize that whatever comes will come to pass, not to stay. Nothing remains forever. Not the good times and certainly not the bad times. Life is a river. And as you travel down that river, you will encounter times of failure and disappointment. But there will also be times of great success. Triumph comes to those who have learned to wait and to endure and press forward into their future. Douglas MacArthur, one of the great generals in American history, once said that age wrinkles the body, but quitting wrinkles the soul. The process of waiting and enduring qualifies you for the next step, the step into your destiny. This process will take you out of your debt. It will alleviate you from those deteriorating and debilitating relationships. The divine promise is your guiding light and the anchor of your soul, preventing you from succumbing to the temptation to give up right when you are so close to stepping over to the other side. Belief determines action. What you believe is very important. If you base your life on the belief of negative and false information, then it will affect who you are and what you do. Your life is the sum total of what you have believed up until this point. Too many people have based their life upon the negative information fed to them by parents, siblings, teachers, friends, and even preachers. This bad information has led to a life of sorrow and shame. The first step to a new life is to delete all the old negative thought and injurious actions and begin to upload into your spirit new information 
based upon the truth of God's word. God's truth about who you are and what your destiny is will set you free from emotional blindness, a spirit of poverty, negative speech, and rejection. This new information will empower you to become a winner and not a quitter. It will give you a new set of eyes for the future and the destiny that awaits you. You will begin to understand that life is not based upon a welfare system. It is not based upon what others can give you, but what you can create for yourself as you are willing to embrace the process that will guide you to success. John Locke said that it is one thing to show a man that he is in error and another to put him in position of truth. It is easy to point out people's faults. They are always so obvious, but this will never change the person. Better to put the truth in their hands. By the power of truth, a life will change. In order to be empowered by the truth, you have to understand the difference between facts and truth. Truth is the sum total of the facts. The fact is that you have failed in life. The truth, however, is that you are not a failure. As poet Maya Angelou once wrote, there's a world of difference between truth and facts. Facts can obscure the truth. Far too many Christians allow the facts to obscure the truth. They think that the fact that they are in the midst of a trial means that they have failed. They don't understand the truth that the road that leads to blessing sometimes, often, goes through valleys and dark places. They don't understand the truth that right now is your time. The enemy had a plan to eliminate you and to confuse you with a pile of irrelevant facts. One of the many reasons why he could not kill you is because you had not yet received your promise. Once you have matriculated through this school of hard knocks and spiritual development, the truth is that the promise given so long ago will become a reality. The Theology of Time Theology, in its narrow sense, is the study of God and His relationship with humanity and the world. Time is simply a period in which something exists, existed, or continues on. Hence, the theology of time is the study of God and His relationship with humanity and the world as it relates to time. Why does that matter at all? It does matter because before you can accurately understand God's season or why things happen the way they do, you must first realize that God has created time as a means to introduce His revelation to mankind. Once upon a time, God. God enters our world through revelation. Now, I realize that what I've just said stands in direct contradiction to what many others teach on this subject. Many believe that they have the ability to choose when revelation comes to them from God. Or they'll say, I need a revelation from the Lord, so let me go and get one. Although that may sound really spiritual, I'm not sure that it makes much biblical sense. If we are the ones who control the time issue, that means that God is man's maitre d, waiting to serve him at his beck and call. We become the master and God becomes the servant. Listening to most people's prayers, this is exactly what God has become. This is not how God's timing works. I cannot appoint myself as the next candidate for his next revelation. In fact, there is really not much that I can do to be chosen by him. If I were able to put myself in the position to be qualified or competent and think that somehow I can influence God at any time, then I would be acting on a false premise that God will reveal his thoughts to me based on my personal or spiritual merit. My merit has nothing to do with God's timing. Timing is based upon his grace, that is, his undeserved favor. In fact, God loves to choose the less deserving in order to manifest His glory. Do you realize what a mess life would be 
and how grossly unfair if revelation were based on merit. In short, the rich, the intellectuals, the elite, and of course the pious clerics would be the only ones receiving God's revelation. That would not be just. And God is and always will be a just God. You have only to look at the life of Jesus to see how God operates. Jesus delivers his words to the least and the last, to those who live on the outer fringes of the religious and secular culture. Jesus was the king of one-liners, and these spiritual aphorisms centered on those that he chose to reveal himself. The last shall be first. The least are the greatest in the kingdom. Jesus had a way of turning the religious world upside down. Humanism has taught us that we are the masters of our own fate and creators of our own destiny. That insidious philosophy has penetrated our religious souls so that we begin to think that we really have something to do with God's process of selection. I hate to be the bearer of bad news. The truth is, that you have absolutely nothing to do with that at all. God chooses whom he pleases. It is all based on his sovereign will and amazing grace. There are at least two kinds of people in the world. There are those who think that they can manipulate God and those who think that God would never choose them. If it's all based on his sovereign will, then will he ever notice me amidst the billions of people in the world? That is a question worthy of an answer, because it could seem that the world is one enormous lottery scheme in which God hands out lottery tickets to all, and with one scratch of the finger, some are chosen and others are rejected. Most people feel like they will never get selected. They have had bad luck all of their lives. That may be what it seems like to you, but that is not how God works. Your life is not in the hands of fate and chance, as the Greeks believed. God is bigger than that. And in his theology of time, looking at things from his judicial and gracious perspective, every single person has a destiny, a wonderful future determined by a loving God. I'm not talking about heaven. I'm not referring to the sweet by and by. I'm talking about right here and now. God has designed a life of fulfillment and pleasure that looks nothing like the hell that has encompassed your life. He has created you with a unique style, with a particular purpose. There is no evolutionary, random order to God's purpose. There is only a powerful design that is being worked out by God in your life. So his system is nothing like the lottery where your life is controlled by the fate of purchasing the right ticket. That's hype. In God, there's no hype. It's all real. Anticipation. One of the great joys of life. Time works in your favor, particularly when you know for sure that even if it's not today, your day will come, guaranteed. Your day will come, and you will have everything everything you need to be successful and to fulfill your destiny. One of the reasons I believe God set it up this way is so that we would trust him and learn that all good things come to those who wait. Anticipation is one of the great joys of life. It brings focus and creates desire. Samuel Smiles, the 18th century Scottish author, said, that an intense anticipation itself transforms possibility into reality. Our desires being often but precursors of the things which we are capable of performing. Anticipation is a great motivator and drives the human soul towards its anticipated end. But if we controlled our own destiny and could demand from God whatever we wanted, then we would have eliminated the power of anticipation. How would you ever develop genuine faith in him if you knew that he had to do whatever you say? God does not work like that. He created time, 
Man did not. God has all the time in the world. Time was created for his purposes, and he uses time to bring forth his destiny in your life. Although he is not constrained or limited by time, in another sense, God has got all the time in the world. He is never in a hurry. And since he intuitively knows when it is the right time for sorrow to be turned into joy, he will wait until that time comes. It will come. It always does. The process of waiting creates the desired anticipation so that when it comes, we will be able to better appreciate the treasure. We can only appreciate the miracle of the sunrise if we have lived through the dark night of the soul. Waiting causes a refinement of our priorities and a sharpening of our vision and a shaping of our souls. When we first receive the promise, we do not have clear priority, sharp vision, or the character to contain the gift. Time is a tester. Whatever endures the test of time will stand. Time is a creator. Within the context of time, lives are created and success is achieved. Understanding God's Time Some things will never come to us until it is time, especially the things that God wants to give us. Timing is everything. If you allow impatience to rule and seek to bypass God's timing, there will be disastrous results. Just ask Abraham. The present state of life in the Middle East is the result of one man seeking to get the promise his way. If you were to be honest with yourself, you would admit that some of your past failures are the result of running ahead of God's time and pursuing things when you were not ready for those things. I admit that I have prematurely entered into relationships that would have succeeded and had healthier results if I had only waited for the right season. St. Augustine said that patience is the companion to wisdom. Patience is not a common trait of the human species and especially of us living in the Western world. With all of our technologies, we are geared for instant access, instant service, and instant messaging. In God's world, it doesn't work that way, and that is why so many people are struggling. Many people enter into marriage without ever considering if this was the right person and if the timing was right. Drifting along on the sea of our emotions and allowing those emotions to determine our lives have led many people down a blind alley. And when that happens, it clearly spells disaster. We can't expect to make solid decisions based on our emotions, particularly since they are so volatile. Patience produces wisdom. It gives us the time to accurately think through our decisions. It allows time for God to invade our thought processes. Until we learn this truth, we will continue to miss the mark and prolong the process. But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his Son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoptions of Son. Galatians 4, 4-5, through 5, KJV Fullness of time, at the right time, when it is most propitious, and adventurous, God entered into our world in the person of Christ. It is interesting that Jesus Christ did not enter into the earth realm in a physical sense until it was the time. He was desperately needed long before he was born. If we had been the judges of time, we would have sent him a lot sooner. The Bible tells us that Sodom was an increasingly wicked city. But the men of Sodom were wicked and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. Genesis 13, 13 KJV. They were so wicked that God could not even find two handfuls of people who were living righteous lives within that entire region. It was obvious that Jesus was needed then. But God waited. There was a future time that would be more perfect than that time. 
when everything lined up perfectly, then he was sent into our world. Just because it doesn't happen today does not mean that it won't happen. It's just not time. All of life confirms the truth of time. An embryo has to go through nine-month gestation period in its mother's womb before it can be born with the best possibility of perfect health with the least chance of complication. Now, a baby can be born at six or even five months and live. However, it will often have to undergo special treatment to correct what should have occurred in the womb. In a premature birth, the newborn's brain, organs, and even limbs can be underdeveloped, necessitating medical treatment to strengthen those weak body parts. That newborn baby is often labeled a preemie, or a premature baby, because it has not completed the full cycle preordained to ensure the right time for delivery. Growth is not instantaneous. It happens within the womb of time. When you try to rush your due time, you will end up losing time and then will have to play catch up. Solomon articulated it well when he said that to everything there is a time and a season. The converse is true. When your time comes, nothing can stop it. When is your time, there is nothing that can stop that promise from coming forth. The story of Lazarus, recorded in John 11, establishes this truth. One day, Jesus got word that his good friend Lazarus was dying. Lazarus' sisters, Mary and Martha, were begging him to come. His disciples thought that he would leave immediately. To their consternation, he did not. His disciples didn't get it. There is a need, so why aren't you going to him? Jesus waited till Lazarus had died. This makes no sense. Jesus had the power to heal his friend, but waited till he died. This sounds like bad timing. Jesus appeared to be totally insensitive to Mary and Martha's feelings. Mary, Martha, and Lazarus were dear and close friends of Jesus. Whenever Jesus would travel through their town on his way to a particular region, he would always stop off at their home and eat and hang out there with them. He was comfortable in their presence and loved them so much. Not only were they his friends, they were also believers. Why is that so important? It was dangerous to be associated with Jesus because of his controversial ministry. People were calling him Messiah, and many were following him, much to the chagrin of the religious leaders. They were always watching to see who was hanging out with this guy. Most people realized that their lives would be in great jeopardy by merely listening to and agreeing with his teaching. Yet, these sisters loved him so much and believed in him so unwaveringly that they knew that if Jesus were there even seconds before their brother's death, that he would be able to heal him. How could he not answer their cry for help? I believe Jesus must have been as grieved as Mary and Martha as he contemplated the crushing disappointment that his friends must be feeling at his seemingly indifference to Lazarus' need. Their hurt and pain became his hurt and pain. This was the only time that we see recorded that Jesus wept. He might have wept not only because he felt their grief, but because they did not understand the times and seasons of the Father. They did not realize that whenever God shows up, it is always the right time. It is impossible for God to be late. God had a better plan. Remember that God does not operate in our realm of minutes, hours, days, weeks, and years. He exists outside of time. The disciples lived in an earthly dimension and could not see that plan. When Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, they finally understood that Father knows best. God's Time, the Fifth Dimension In the same way, Father knows what is best for your life. God is waiting for some things to die in you before he will show up with a miracle. There can be no resurrection until there is a death. 
That is part of the process. His delays are not denials. They are simply part of the process of preparation so that you are ready to enjoy what God is going to bring into your life. Between the promise and the fulfillment, you will walk through the valley of the shadow of death. The reason for this is that God will not reveal himself in the season that you think is best. The God that lives above and beyond time is the one that understands the proper time for your rescue, your healing, your blessing, and your victory. God's time is not our time, but it is the right time. Timing is a vision thing. We cannot see from his point of view. Our vision is obstructed by our placement in this time-slash-space world. We live in a three-dimensional world, including longitude, latitude, and altitude. We cannot exist in two places at the same time. Einstein defined time as the fourth dimension. God, however, lives in another dimension that is not controlled by longitude, latitude, or altitude, and is unhindered by clocks and calendars. He lives outside of time, but chooses to work within time. His time is the fifth dimension. It is another time that he controls. He can make the sun to shine in the middle of the winter, the snow to fall in spring, and rain to pour in the middle of autumn. And he can cause a good old nor'easter cold front to come blowing through the middle of a blistering hot August. The bottom line is, whenever he comes is the right time and the right season. When it's time for him to come through on your behalf, nothing in the world would be able to stop the success that he has chosen for your life. Time, an enemy or a friend. I'm always amazed by the behavior of small children. If you promise a small child that you're going to take him in six months to Six Flags Amusement Park or to the zoo, then every day until that time arrives, you will have to endure his instant questionings and badgering. When are we going to the zoo? Is it tomorrow? Next week? When? Please, please tell me. Or if you're just going on a trip from Los Angeles to San Diego, as soon as you leave your driveway, make two lefts and a right onto the freeway, you hear the little backseat drivers asking, are we there yet? Often our behavior is very much like children in that respect. We make ourselves miserable while waiting for our promise to manifest. They have no concept of time, but neither do we. Like the Rolling Stones saying, time is on my side. Time is actually your friend. Before you can understand this truth, you have to recognize that within the time period between your promise given and your promise received, you can be engaged in the process of maturation. Many people miss this vital lesson and never actualize the full meaning and purpose of waiting within time. Jesus, the master storyteller, once told a story about wise and foolish virgins that illustrates this point. Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lamps, and went forth to meet the bridegroom. And five of them were wise, and five were foolish. They that were foolish took their lamps, and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight there was a cry made. Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said unto the wise, Give us your oil, for our lamps are gone out. But the wise answered, saying, Not so, lest there be not enough for us and you. But go ye rather to them that sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and they that were ready went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. Matthew 25, 1 through 10, KJV. Each one of these ten virgins had equal time and opportunity to do what needed to be done. 
They all had equal access. But the Bible tells us that five of them were wise and five were foolish. The five that were foolish did not lack intelligence or business skill. They were not cognitively underdeveloped. What made them foolish was their poor utilization of the time allotted them. They were lazy in their waiting. They did not take advantage of the waiting time. They should have been working while they were waiting. They procrastinated. Procrastination is the enemy of time and results in lost opportunity. You should never consider it a negative thing when you have to wait for God's promise to come to pass. During that period of time, you should be involved in the process that will lead you to the promise. They prepared for the moment when the groom would arrive. In our world, this is also true. Too many women are looking for the right husband rather than focusing on becoming the right woman. Because these women are looking rather than preparing, many men pass them by. By the way, this applies to you men as well. Countless number of Christians that I preach to all over this country sincerely desire to be wealthy. They believe that God has told them that they will have wealth and prosperity. Here is the problem. The word is good and true, but they make no preparation for the wealth that is on the way. During that waiting period, they could be getting out of debt, taking finance classes, reading books on finances, and attending investment workshops. But instead, they choose to do nothing. When the money comes, it passes them right by. Because success comes to those who have prepared for success. The time between the promise given and the promise received is preparation time. It is the time in which God wants to prepare us to handle the blessing that is coming our way. The foolish virgins slept while the wise virgins worked. Had that been me, I would have ordered a few cups of coffee and expected to pull an all-nighter. There would be no way that I would allow my opportunity to pass me by if I had anything to do with it. I know that I said that God is sovereign and that he reveals himself to whomever he chooses, but that does not preclude your involvement in making your dream come alive. Once the promise comes to you, and once you have been given a vision for your life, you need to plan and prepare to enter into your dream. That is the purpose of waiting. Time is a gift given to you by God for the purpose of preparation so that you can handle the success He wants to give you. Time was designed by the Father to be your friend, and it will be as long as you consciously choose to treat her with respect. If you abuse the time allotted to you, then you will shockingly discover that when you try to make your grand entry into your promise, the door will be shut. Don't make time your enemy. In time, I will trust. Rather than despising time, you need to trust time. You need to use time for your benefit. Some people act as if God is on their timetable. They believe that God has to prove something to them before they will give him their undivided loyalty. God does not have to prove anything to you. He has never broken his promises. Time is given for the purpose of developing trust in God. If you wait to trust God, you will miss God. You'll miss your appointment and therefore miss his directions. Lack of trust will create further delays. They will not be God's delays. They will be delays created by your lack of trust in God. If you learn to trust him, he will direct your life. He will provide a road map that will lead you to a place of great blessing and success. If you don't trust him, he won't give you the road map. No road map, no progress. No progress, no promise. It's as simple as that. The more you trust, the more he reveals himself in the midst of your waiting. Time is on your side if you learn to trust God while going through the process to the promise. As trust is being built, time will collapse and the promise will become yours.